to be thankful for. But in the meanwhile, I'm going to ask that we please stand. There's a scripture there in the, where Paul, where Paul asked God three times to remove the thorn from his flesh. We don't know what it was. But God told him, my grace is sufficient. And that's exactly what this song says. Your grace is enough. here this morning. Visitors, visitors, if you're here for the first time, welcome. This place is so much better because you're here this morning. In the bulletin, uh, I put it down somewhere. Okay, on the right side there is a section that we ask you to just fill out some brief information. Tear that out, put it in the offering plate as it goes by. 
Uh, leave us an email, a phone number if you'd like us to get in touch with you. Uh, if you'd like to reach any of the ministers here uh, that are available, please feel free to mark that down there on the bulletin also. So again, Happy New Year to everyone. Let's give each other a welcome. Say hello to each other. How are you? Good morning. Good to see you again. And you too. As we come back to our seats, please remain standing. This is a new song we introduced this past year. We've heard it on the radio by third day. Soul on fire.
strength is failing. The end draws near and my time has come. Still my soul will sing your praise. exciting today, uh, day to be in God's house. It just seems like 2015 just completely flew by for me and my wife and our family, and I'm sure a lot of you would say the same thing, especially when we hit December, man, it just turned into a frenzied phase, and now we're in a new year. And I hope that you had a wonderful, wonderful break. Hope you had an excellent Christmas and a wonderful new year, and I hope that you're excited to start this uh, new year the right way, and obviously you are because you started the new year in God's house, coming together to worship Him and to spend some time in God's Word, and I can't think of a better place for us to be than on this first Sunday of the new year. Uh, I was reading a book the other day, and I came across a um, very, very well-known Christian author, and, and um, he, he, he said something that was very disturbing to me, and it kind of led into what I want to talk about this morning. He said this, he said, lately what I've been doing is I've been going up and asking questions to people, just random strangers that I meet. He says, if I'm at a coffee shop, if I'm on an airplane, you know, something, you know, just I'm at, a, I'm at a, a, a waiting room or something like that. He said, I'll have conversations with strangers, and, and, and I talk to them a little bit, and I don't tell them that I'm a pastor or anything like that. He says, but then I ask them eventually, once I've, you know, kind of gotten their defenses down a little bit, and they've dropped their guard a little bit, I ask them, you know, when I say this word, I want to know what comes to mind. And then he says the word, evangelical Christian. And he said almost every time, it's one of just a few responses. He says people will come up and, and, and they'll say the things that, that they think of when you say evangelical Christian. It'll be something that's political. And even that they associate evangelical Christianity with politics or, or with forceful, you know, angry pro-life activists or, or angry gay rights opponents. Or, or they'll even bring up something called the moral majority, which the moral majority was disbanded like I think 20 years ago or 30 years ago or something like that. But that's kind of what they associate with evangelical Christianity. He said not once. Not ever have I heard someone say when, you know, just a stranger that I talked to, he said not once have they ever said, oh, well, well I think of abundant grace when you say evangelical Christianity. Apparently grace is really not the scent that the church is giving off to this world. 
And so because of that, when I read that, and that's the truth, I mean, we've talked about that in the past, I thought that it would be a good idea this year to start a brand new series on uh, the first Sunday of January, and I think it's a good idea for us to start a series just studying the topic, this idea of grace. We've talked about it in the past. I believe that the church has an image problem in our society. I think that the world, um, that, that those that aren't associated with Christianity, even some of those that are associated with Christianity, they really think negatively of the church. You know, a lot of people think that Christians are cruel, that we're not kind, that we're not compassionate, that we're judgmental, that we're hypocritical. A lot of people would never in a million years associate the word grace with Christianity. And folks, that absolutely breaks my heart. I don't know if it bothers you, but it should. Because here's what I believe. I believe the church is the specific and intentional vehicle that God chose before the world was even created. He chose the church to be the vehicle that he was going to use to communicate his message of hope and love and grace and forgiveness to a world that is in desperate need of it. A world that is dying to know their Savior. And if people think that the church is just not nice... To put it in the simplest terms, if we're not friendly and fun to be around, then they're not going to want anything to do with us. And if they don't want anything to do with us, then guess what? They don't want anything to do with our God. And the sad reality of that is if they don't want anything to do with our God because we've given a poor representation, then that means there's a lot of people, a lot of people that are going to die. And they're going to spend an eternity separated from their creator in hell. In the worst kind of nightmare that we can't even begin to imagine or to describe. Now, a lot of preachers don't like to talk about that. A lot of people like to not talk about hell and let's just make everyone feel good. And let's just pump everybody up and just work harder and try harder. But that's not the scripture. That's not what the gospel says. And believe me, I don't find any joy. I don't find any glee in saying that there are a lot of people that if they don't know our Savior, they're going to spend an eternity in hell. That breaks my heart. And I hope that it breaks your heart as well. I hope that you get passionate about that. But that's the truth. If we don't have that relationship with Jesus Christ, then we're not going to spend an eternity in heaven. And then on top of that, we're not going to be able to deal with the pressures that this life is inevitably going to throw at us. So we have to be a people that are defined by grace. We have to be a people that give a good representation of the, uh, to the world of what Christianity is and what Jesus Christ looked like. Now something that's always bothered me is when you read the scriptures, it doesn't look like that. Okay, When you read the scriptures, man, grace, it just sticks out. Like a sore thumb. Grace is everywhere. Jesus, we've talked about this. Jesus was defined by grace. Remember John said he is the perfect embodiment of grace and truth. And what bothers me so much is grace is so easy to find in your Bible. And, 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 and so many people, when Jesus was here on earth, they looked at him and they said, that's a man of kindness. That's a man of grace and mercy and forgiveness. What bothers me is so many times the reaction that people got or that Jesus got when people encountered him versus the reaction that they get or, or that we have when they encounter Christians that, that, that are Christ followers. It's the complete opposite. It is completely different from the way that they responded to Jesus. See, if you look at the Gospels, you find that the worst people in society, they flock to Jesus. You couldn't keep them away from Jesus. And chances are, the worst that a person felt about themselves, you know, the, the sinners, the, the tax collectors, the prostitutes, the ones that the religious establishment, the ones that society had said, you're an outcast. We have nothing for you. If you look, the, the ones that felt the worst about themselves, they were the ones that were most likely going to find a friend in Jesus Christ. Jesus was defined by grace. And what worries me, the question that I have is, has the church lost that gift of grace. Has the church, has the church lost that, that defining quality that made Jesus such an amazing individual that people wanted to be around him? Has the church lost that ability to invite people in to this environment? And even if they don't look anything like us, even if they've got a lot of baggage and they bring a lot of junk to the table, do they feel welcome here? Do they feel like we're people that are going to love them regardless? Because that's how people felt when they encountered Jesus. Sinners loved being around him. People that looked nothing like Jesus, you could not keep them away. And many, many times, many times in our culture, the same thing is not going to be said about the church. And so I think that it's very appropriate for us at the beginning of this new year to find out how can we be a people that are defined by grace? How can we be a people that look like Jesus did? 
And that's why we're going to start that, this new series today, because I want 2016 to be the year that the people of First Baptist Church of Castroville are completely defined and characterized by one word, grace. I want us to be all about grace in 2016. And I think the best place for us to start at the beginning of the new year is in the beginning of the Bible. So that's what we're going to do. We're actually going to start at the very beginning. And I hope that as we go through this series, we're going to learn how to be a people that show the same kind of crazy and ir illogical and irrational grace that Jesus had. Now, one of the reasons that there's this, con this confusion, one of the reasons that there's this, uh, that this problem with the image that Christianity has is I believe there's a lot of misconceptions that the world has um, about the church. And, and, and there's, there's a lot of reasons that we can have misconceptions about the church. You know, if somebody went to a church when they were younger and, and, and the church, they, they were just mean and judgmental and, and, you know, they weren't kind and they weren't friendly and they didn't feel welcome there, well, of course, they're going to have a poor understanding. They're going to be confused about who Jesus is. Maybe somebody, you know, they read an article about a church and they looked and they said, if that's the church and that's Christianity, then I want absolutely nothing to do with it. Has anybody ever heard of the church called Westboro Baptist? It's a perfect example. There's absolutely nothing Baptist about that church. That's the church in Florida that goes and they pickets and they do all kinds of terrible things. They're, they're not related to any Baptist denomination. They don't look like anything Baptist. I don't even think they're related to Christianity. In fact, I wish that they would all just meet Jesus and that they would repent and stop giving the rest of us a bad name. But so many times people have these misconceptions of the church and there's a lot of different reasons. Well, one of the things I believe that causes confusion is people have a poor understanding of the Bible. They have a lack of understanding about the Bible, about God's Word. You see, a lot of people, they think that God's Word, this book that we bring on Sunday mornings that we study, they believe this is a book that was written by one individual thousands of years ago. And it's just one big book that somebody sat down and they wrote. And if you read it cover to cover, they're going to say, well, there's too many inconsistencies. And what, wrong, what was wrong with this person? And, and I can't, you know, it just doesn't line up with my theology or my philosophy or anything like that. And so they just discount the whole thing. What they don't realize is the Bible is a collection of writings. It's a collection of different books and letters and poetry and narrative and prose and lyrics and all these different kinds of things. And they've been brought together. And it was written over hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of years by many different individuals. And it was brought together and it was put into one canon. It was not written by one individual thousands of years ago. But if people don't realize that, then they're going to be confused about the Bible. And so first-time readers, what they do a lot of times is they pick up the Bible and they say, whoa, I started in the beginning of the Bible and there's this huge contrast between the God of the Old Testament and the way that Jesus represents God in the New Testament. And they say, if that's how it is, then, then, then I can't have anything to do with that God of the Old Testament because he's kind of scary. And let's just be real honest this morning. There's some of us that have been familiar with the Bible and been in church our entire lives. We have a hard time. We struggle with some of the stuff that's in the Old I struggle with some of the stuff that is in the Old Testament stories. See, what happens a lot of times is when we're kids, we're exposed to some of those Old Testament stories. And we take it out of the bigger narrative, and we take it out of the context of what is going on and what God is doing, and we just focus on the really positive points when we're young. And so for kids, you know, they sing songs, and they have color books and all this kind of stuff, and, and God shows up, and Noah builds this ark, and his family's rescued from the flood, and they, you know, the animals come two by two, and that's all fun and fine and good when you're a kid. And then you grow up, and you read the rest of the story, and you realize, oh, that's great for Noah and his family, but millions and millions of people die in the flood. That's kind of a hard thing to swallow. That's kind of a difficult thing that we struggle with. So, so we focus on just God delivering the people of Noah, but we forget the other part of the story that's really hard for us to accept. Dr. Richard Dawkins, in fact, he, he, he's a famous atheist. He's written a lot of books. Um, he read through the Old Testament. He had a lot of problems with the God of the Old Testament. In fact, he wrote a book called The God Delusion. And in this book, this is what he wrote. Okay? This is not me saying this. This is what Richard Dawkins said. He said, the God of the Old Testament is arguably the most unpleasant character in all of fiction. He's jealous and he's proud of it. He is a petty, unjust, unforgiving man. And ultimately, he's just a big bully. That's the impression that this very famous, very intelligent individual had of the God of the Old Testament. And he wasn't the first one to come up with that. In fact, I believe it was in the first century, there was a bishop, a bishop in the church that had been teaching God's word and teaching people about Jesus. 
He had such a problem with the contrast between Jesus and who he was and what he taught about God and the God of the Old Testament that this guy named Marcion, he actually said they were two different individuals, that the God of the Old Testament was not the same God of the New Testament. He went on and founded like his own kind of sub-religion out of Christianity called Marcionism because he could just not balance out or, or deal with the difference there, the contrast there that you have in the Old Testament and in the New Testament. And so... A lot of people would say, well, then what, what we should do if we're going to talk about grace is we should start in the book of Matthew. Because it sure looks like in the book of Matthew that, that, that Jesus' birth kind of ushered in this new age, this new era of grace. So it only makes sense that we would begin there. But I want to begin in the Old Testament. In fact, I want to begin all the way back in the book of Genesis. If you have your Bible, you can open the book of Genesis. And if not, we'll have it on the screen in just a minute. Uh, I want to look in the, in the beginning because I think if we look for it, I think we're going to see that grace is very present. I think that if we'll revisit some of these Old Testament texts, we'll see that, you know what, it does stick out. It's not just in the New Testament. It's there in the Old Testament as well. Well, the Old Testament opens with like this origin story. And, and, and basically what Moses does, a guy named Moses, the one who delivered the Israelites from Egypt, he's the one that wrote the, five, the first five books uh, of the Old Testament, including the book of Genesis. What had happened is the Israelites had been in captivity. They'd been in slavery um, in, in Egypt uh, for hundreds of years, for centuries, literally. And so what happens is, is for all these years, they've been exposed to these, uh, these, these pagan views, these pagan mythologies, and this polytheistic view of who God, who the gods are of the world. And all that stuff has filtered into their understanding of God. So basically, Moses writes this book because he says, no, 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 that's all myth. That's all, that, you know, that, that's folklore. That's not real. That's not where the world came from. And he wants the people of Israel to understand where they came from and who God really was and, 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 and understand a little bit about his character. Now, if you look at other ancient religions during that time, you're going to find that all of them have origin stories. All of them have creation stories. The difference during that time, though, was so many, of them, most if not all, of those other religions, they said that the world came from, or, or they said that, that their gods, they just kind of showed up. They inhabited a world or a, a universe um, that had already been created. None of them created it. They just showed up and they kind of ran it. Well, the Hebrew God was completely different because he created the universe from nothing. He existed before the universe was here. He was the one that created all time and space and matter, put the whole thing into motion, and he was in control, and he was in charge. He brought everything from nothing. So look at Genesis chapter 1, and we're going to look at the first two verses right here. It says, In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Now the earth was formless and empty. Darkness was over the surface of the deep. And the Spirit of God was hovering over the waters. Now, right here, this is the first time that we encounter God's grace. We didn't have to get too far into the Bible, did we? I mean, we got into chapter 1, verse 1, page 1, and we already see God's grace. Let me point it out to you. God didn't have to create the universe. He wanted to. Have you ever sat down and thought about that? The maker of all things didn't have to make anything. He chose to make everything. I want, you to do, I want you to do something for me for just a minute. I want you to try and imagine nothing, okay? Think about nothing. Don't think about us being here. Don't think about what you've got to do for lunch or, or you know, your New Year's resolutions or anything like that or all the gifts you have to return from Christmas. Just think about nothing, absolutely nothing, okay? Don't, 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 don't think about anything in your mind, okay? The absence of all light and sound and smells, the absence of everything. Okay? With that in your mind, answer this question for me. Why did God choose to create? Nothing is there. There is, there is no world. There is no universe. There's not even empty space. Do you understand that? Our universe is made up of so much empty space. There's not even empty space. So with all that in mind, with nothing there, why did the God of the universe choose to create the universe? Do you think it's because he was lonely? Do you think God was just like, man, I wish I, wish I had someone to talk to? I'm just so, so, so lonely, and I just need, no, I don't, I don't think that's the case at all. God is a perfect being, and I believe that he is perfectly content in himself. If nothing else, we have the Trinity. We have God the Father, God the Son, Jesus Christ, and God the Holy Spirit. They're good. I mean, they're fine. They, they're not lonely. They don't need us by any means. So we, we can scratch out he created because he was lonely. Do you think God was bored? Do you think that he just wanted something to do? And he's like, man, we've been around for a long time. I'm kind of tired of talking to you guys. So let's just create something, okay? Let's do something that's never been done before. I don't think that's the case. 
I think that the mind of God is so complex and so limitless that he could have just sat around and thought for all of eternity, and that would have been enough. He would have been content in that because, again, he is a perfect, completely perfect being. He didn't have to create in order to keep busy. What about this reason? Do you think God was forced to create? Now, really, I, I don't think that one's going to hold up any evidence or, or hold up any, any weight in court um, because who's going to force God to create? Like, who's going to bully God and say, you have to create something? I mean, is God going to force himself to create something when he didn't want to create something? No, I don't think God has an identity disorder. So why? Why then did he create? Well, I think the only option that we're left with is God created all of this stuff so that you would have the opportunity to exist. So that I would have the opportunity to exist. But again, he wasn't forced to do that. God was under no obligation to give you the right to live. He was under no obligation to give me the opportunity to exist. See, in the beginning, God created because of grace. In the very first verse of the first chapter of the Bible, we see evidence of God's grace. He just created to give us an opportunity to live. Well, then Moses goes on. And, and look in verse 3. Um, we see that after God created everything, then God spoke into the darkness. Look at what he said in verse 3. God said, let there be light, and then God saw that the light was good. Now, let me tell you, or, or let me ask you, I don't think that God is the only one that would say light is good. I, I mean, I think that we would say that light is good. In fact, those of you that are sitting like in this section, you may be thinking, it, it is good, so let's turn the lights on. I can't take notes. I don't know what's going on. We think light is very good. Uh, a couple of years ago, uh, we were in Orange. I think it was in August. It might have been in July. Um, it, was in the, it was in the, probably the, the late afternoon. And in August, um, in Orange, it's like 100 degrees outside and like 100% humidity. So it's just miserable. Like you can't even go outside half the time because you just melt. It's terrible. Well, anyways, this one afternoon, the, a transformer blows in my neighborhood. And, and my wife and I were just like, this is absolutely horrible. If you don't think light is good, go turn the lights off to your house tonight when it's freezing. Go turn the lights off, the power off to your house in the middle of summer when it's burning up. Brittany and I were sitting there, and the lights were off for like five and a half hours. And finally around nine o'clock, I looked there, I was like, if they don't turn the lights on, because I can't deal with this. This is just horrible. We're at least going to have to go stay at the Hilton or the, the, the Hampton down the road or something like that. Light is a good thing. Um, at my last church, when Hurricane Rita came through and, and just, uh, I mean, just flooded the entire town, and the same thing when Katrina came and knocked all the trees over, so many homes, so many neighborhoods were, were without power for like months on end. They told me that when the power company would come in and they get their lights turned back on, there would be there would just be a parade of people in the streets just clapping and applauding and saying thank you, thank you so much. It's been so miserable here for us being in the dark and not having light. So God created the light into the darkness, and he said it is good. He said that it is a good thing. But again, was God forced to create light? He creates the universe. He could have left the entire universe in darkness. We wouldn't have known. We would have not known the difference had God not created light for us. See, the entire creation of the story, you can find it happening like that. God going through and him, him bringing something else into the creation that is going to make life better for us here on earth. And at the end of all of it, he says, that is good. I mean, he, he brings order into this entire empty universe. He divides, he divides the night from the day and the light from the darkness and the dry land from the water and all of these different things. He fills the world with an environment that is amazing, that is capable to sustain life, that is capable to sustain life in a comfortable way. Have you ever thought about that? Have you ever, I mean, just, have you ever thought about the day to day, the fact that we can get up and we can breathe and that we can eat and that we can grow and that, you know, I'm sure we have sickness and all those kinds of things, but for the most part, I mean, we're able to live relatively comfortably. You know, if you get up this afternoon, if you go 20 miles to the east of here, you're going to run into like a lot more traffic than what we deal with in Castroville, and you're going to find a lot more restaurants. If you go just 20 miles straight up, you know what's going to happen if you don't have a spacesuit? What's going to happen? You're going to die. It's not a trick question. If you go 20 miles straight up, you're going to die. You can go, you know, 2,000 miles to the east or to the west or north or south, but if you just go 20 miles straight up into the air, you are going to die. So not only did God create this amazing, amazing creation in the universe and world for us, but he made it so that it could sustain life and did it in a way that was comfortable. If you don't think it's comfortable here, go try to live on the moon. Go try to live on Mars without a spacesuit. It's not going to happen. And remember, 
None of this was necessary. God was under no obligation to do this, but he did it anyway. And every single time we get past this step in the creation process, God makes something else that's good. He makes something else that's amazing that's never been made before. God says, man, that's good. God declares that it was good. Do you know why God declared that, that, that all of these things were good in the creation process? I don't think God's just kind of patting himself on the back here. I don't think God's just looking and saying, man, look what I did. That's awesome. Go me. I'm amazing. I don't think that's what he's doing. God is declaring that these things are good, but, but is he saying that they're morally good? I mean, is there anything morally good about land or about the light or about a tree or a plant? Is there anything ethically good or bad uh, about the water or anything like that? So why did he declare this was good? After God created, did you realize there's like over 300 different species of beetles? Why is that good? What's good about all those different beetles? God's a spirit. How is that going to benefit him in the least? Well, the psalmist in Psalm chapter 19, verse 1, he said this. He said, the heavens declare the glory of God. The heavens declare the glory of God. Do you know who that declaration of God's glory is for? It's not just for him. It's for you. And it's for me. God declared each step in the creation process as being good because it was good for you. And it was a good thing for me. That is a clear picture of grace because God was not obligated to do anything good for us. He was not obligated to make a world that could sustain our lives by any means. Then look at Genesis chapter 1 verse 26. So he's created this whole world, this amazing environment. Now look what happens in verse 26. God said, let us make human beings in our image to be like us. Let us make human beings in our image to be like us. Do you know what he did with humans after that? So he creates life. He doesn't have to. He just creates life to give us the opportunity to exist. And then you know what he does? After, do you know what he tells the first two human beings after he creates them? You know what he says to them? He says, go and enjoy what I've made for you. Go and find delight in my creation that I made for you. See, everything that God so meticulously created... And if you think about how your bodies are put together and all the different proteins and, and amino acids in your DNA and all that different kind of stuff and the complexities of, of, of you know, oxygen being in our environments and our atmosphere and all these different things, God said that it was good. Um, all that stuff that he created, he created it for you and for me. That is a clear picture of grace. Folks, because he didn't have to do that. Verse 29, he says, I want to give you all the plants on the earth. To, I'm going to give all the plants on the earth to you for food. They're yours. Enjoy them. God made this complex world. He filled it with life. He filled it with goodness and with blessing and all these different things. He made it so that it could sustain life. Then he creates human beings and he gives it away as a gift. Have you ever thought about that? And do you know what, what we did to deserve such a, a perfect and unique and amazing and unspoiled world? Do you know what we did? To deserve that? Absolutely nothing. We didn't do anything to deserve that. We didn't do anything to earn that. Folks, that is a perfect picture of grace. You getting something awesome, and you don't deserve it. You getting something amazing that you haven't earned, you haven't bought, you haven't paid for, and the individual that gave it to you was under no obligation to give it to you in the first place. That is grace. So we see right here, creation Creation is simply God's first expression of grace and love to you and me. All those sunsets that you get to enjoy that I absolutely love, those are for you. The fact that we have different seasons to harvest and to plant and do all these things so that we can have food, all that stuff is for you. All the varieties of fruits and vegetables, all the different animals that taste good, and they do, they taste good, don't they? All that stuff. He, he didn't have to do that. He could have just made chicken. It made everything taste like chicken. And some of you would love that. And some of you think everything already tastes like chicken. But he didn't do that. He said, I'm going to make this thing called beef. And I'm going to make steaks. And steaks are amazing. And I don't have to do that. But I'm going to do that because they're going to enjoy it. And it's going to put a smile on your face. I'm going to make this stuff called venison. And all those guys in South Texas, they're going to go hunt after. And they're going to make everything out of venison. Even stuff that doesn't taste good, they're just going to make stuff out of venison. Because that's what hunters do in South Texas. Isn't that right, Brittany? She's getting tired of venison because that's all we eat. God didn't have to create all those different varieties of stuff for you to enjoy, but he did it because he delights in your happiness. All, all of the, the beaches that you get to go to on vacation, the mountains that you get to climb, the lakes, the rivers, the forests, the plains, all of that stuff, folks, was for you. There's more beauty in this world than a person could ever possibly comprehend in their life. 
There's more, there's more food in this world and different kinds of foods that a person could consume in 10 different lifetimes. And do you know why that is? It's because that is the nature of grace. That's just how grace is. Folks, grace is never just enough. Grace is always more than enough. That's why everything doesn't taste like chicken. Because grace isn't just enough. Grace is always more than enough. And so from the very beginning, God sets this pattern out that goes all through the Bible and all through our lives of giving us more than we deserve, more than we've asked for, more than we could have ever wanted or imagined. Well, then in the midst of all of this, all that's good, God looks and He says, okay, I've done this amazing thing, but there's still something lacking. There's still something missing. Turn over to chapter 2, verse 18. God's just, he's done something never been done. There is no history at this point. God's done something that's never been done in history. Um, and he created this amazing universe and he creates man in his image. And then look at verse 18. The Lord said, well, there's one thing that's not good. Everything else is good. There's one thing that's not good. It's not good for man to be alone. Once again, we cannot deny God's commitment. We can't ignore his commitment to our love and to his willingness to provide for us. Now, so God creates, he says, it's not good for man to be alone. And he creates woman. Do you know why God created a woman? And no, ladies, it's not because he thought that he could do a better job at that time, okay? He did do a much better job, obviously. You just have to look at my wife, and you can see this. But that's not why he chose to create women, by any means. He created women because he didn't want man to be alone. He says it's not good for man to be alone. See, from the very, very beginning, God wanted the best for us. God could have created just a race of men. We wouldn't have known the difference. He could have created a world full of females. Nobody would have known. The only one that would have known would have been God. And he said, they're missing out on something. So I'm going to create both races. And as a result, I'm going to give them the capacity and the ability to love and have intimacy in a way that they would never have by themselves. I'm going to give them the ability to procreate and to make kids and to make babies and children. And how awesome is it, is it to have kids, folks? I mean, I, I always knew that it would be great when we had um, our first child. And then we had our first child. And the second that she was born, my entire world was flipped upside down. I learned more about God and his nature and his character and his love for me in that first moment, that first breath of my daughter's life in this world than I had the entire time I'd been in seminary. And I went to seminary for like seven years or something just ridiculous, okay? I learned more about God. In that moment of having a child, he gave us the ability, the capacity to have kids. But yeah, they break our hearts sometimes. And yeah, it's difficult with them sometimes. But oh my gosh, the kind of love you're able to experience and give and receive from your children, there's nothing else like it on the planet. He didn't have to do that. He could have said, you know what, they're all going to be like, like born, you know, they're going to be like cabbage. And they're going to just grow out of the ground. And you're going to go to the cabbage farm, cabbage patch kids, hey. <laughs> That's where that came from. Somebody who's actually a theologian and didn't know it. And they said, man, that's how God can be. You just go to the cabbage farm, you pick this one out, you take them home and clean it up, and there's your child. He could have made it like that. I mean, before it was done, there was no example. He could have done that, but he chose to give us a way that we could experience love. We could experience joy and experience this, this great intimacy in a way that we've never experienced before. Well, then, so God creates all of this. He creates man and woman, and, and, and then he gives them a purpose. Look at chapter 1. Flip back to chapter 1, verse 28. God said, he, he creates them and he says, be fruitful. Increase in number. Fill the earth and subdue it. Rule over every creature. Now again, God didn't have to do that. But he gave us a job at that point. He gave us a purpose. He gave us something to do. He basically made us like second in command over the world. Have you ever thought about that? You have like God... And then you have humanity. We're like his ambassadors over the earth. Have you ever thought about that incredible, incredible responsibility and privilege that he has given us? And here's the thing. He didn't have to do that, folks. He, did, he could have just created and said good luck with the whole thing and washed his hands of it. But that's not what he chose to do. Now, here's something that I find very interesting. He creates this amazing place. He creates, this, he creates two people. He creates this garden for them to experience everything they could possibly want to experience. It's got everything they could need up at this point. What I find very interesting is that God only gives them one rule. He just gives them one rule. Look at, uh, look at verse 17 in chapter 2. Here's your one rule. He says, you must not eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. You must not eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. He says, basically, there's a lot of yes trees. And there's one no tree. 
There's a lot of trees that you can climb in, that you can eat from, that you can get shade from, that you can build a house from. There's one tree out of these hundreds or thousands or I don't know how many trees in the garden. There's one tree that I don't want you to touch, that I want you to stay away from. Now, here's why I find that interesting. God has this world and it's perfect. He, he's made it exactly how he wants to make it. He set, he set the first two humans up in this situation, the way that he wanted them to, and he gives them one rule, just one requirement. And you know what our tendency is? Our tendency is to move past that and say that's not a big deal. That's insignificant. But folks, I, need, I think we need to pause there and look at that because that tells us a lot about who God is. It tells us a lot about his character. See, in the very beginning with the first two people, they went to bed every single night. They had no shame, no guilt, no condemnation. They knew exactly where they stood before their Lord. Okay, they, they just have one rule. In the very beginning, God's expressions of grace were limitless. They were infinite. His requirements, His rules were minimal. Have you ever thought about that? In the very beginning, when God's got the world the way He wants it, His expressions of grace, you can't even count them. They're infinite. His rules and his requirements, they're minimal. It's basically like one. And it doesn't get any less than that. Well, I guess it's zero, but you've got to have one rule. You've got to have one requirement. And that's it. And the reason that's important, because what do we do? What have we been taught? We flip it around. We believe the other way. We believe backwards. We believe that, that God's rules and that his requirements are infinite. And that they're, they, you know, there's so many of them, but his expressions of grace are minimal. And we have to really look and we have to really try hard to find evidence of God's love for us and God's grace for us. And there's so many rules and so many requirements and we're never going to live up to it. That's not the way it was in the very beginning. In the very beginning, he said, all this is for you. There's one thing I don't want you to do. See, in the first three chapters, this is important. In the first three chapters, we see that there was more beauty than they could ever absorb. There was more food than they could ever consume. They had purpose. They had intimacy with one another. They had this uninterrupted fellowship and relationship with God. And then on top of all of that, they had freedom. They had the freedom to choose whether or not they wanted to accept God's love and return it and respond to it or ignore it. The same way God was under no obligation uh, to create, they were under no obligation to respond to God's love. In the very beginning, with just the first three chapters of your Bible, we find a perfect example of God's grace with no strings attached at all. In this fragile system of grace and gratitude, it was fueled by an even more fragile ideal, something called trust. See, God trusted humanity with his creation. Every single day, Adam and Eve, they, they, they would wake up and they had the opportunity to choose. Are they going to be trustworthy with this great responsibility? With this great privilege that God has given them. Or are they going to do something different? For a while they were. For a while they were trustworthy and they did right. But eventually, we all know what happened. They violated God's will. Eventually they did the one thing that he said don't do. It's kind of like our kids. Huh? The one thing. You can, have, you can have all these toys. This morning, or no, it was yesterday afternoon. We're in there with our daughter. And she just wants to like mess with stuff that we're, not, we're telling her not to mess with. She's, she was climbing on her table. We bought her a little table that she could sit at for Christmas and have lunch and toys and all that. She's trying to climb on the table. She's got like a toy box full of toys. There's toys all over the living room. My wife's about to lose her mind because it's, it's just, I mean, it looks like a disaster zone in there. And Abigail can play with all this stuff. But she wants to go over here and climb on the table. And we just keep telling her, no, 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 no. But she's not listening. It was the same way. God says, here's all this stuff. This one thing. Don't do this one thing. And of course. They violated God's will. They violated God's trust. And everything changed. And this is where the biggest confusion about grace comes in. We don't understand sin, folks. We really don't have a clear understanding or concept of sin. We don't understand the impact that sin has. Not just on our lives. Not just on our souls and, and our friends and relationships and our families and, and things like that. It impacts in all creation. I mean, all of creation was changed. It was ruined. It suffered when man sinned, when man made this great mistake. Everything was ruined. In fact, the Apostle Paul, he said in the book of Romans this way in chapter 8, verse 21, he says, all of creation was subject to decay. It was subject to corruption when the first man and woman sinned. Now imagine that you and me are writing the story, okay? We've gotten through chapter 2 and everything's going good and God's shown grace and all this kind of stuff. And then we get to Genesis chapter 2. And man, just, man, we blow it, literally. I mean, we do the one thing God said don't do. It doesn't just mess up things for us and things, you know, for us and God. It messes up all of creation. 
The reason that there's anything bad in the world today is because of us. Because sin broke everything. It's been subject to corruption. It's been subject to decay. Just simple things. The reason there's thorns on mesquite bushes that your pastor gets in his leg and gets a staph infection is because of sin. Not my sin. I don't think that was God punishing me. I think it's just because the world is broken and it's messed up. So imagine we're writing the story, okay? And we get to this point. We've created this perfect, unimaginable world from nothing. An entire universe that came from nothing. We made man in our image, and we said, let's give them the ability to love and create and all these different cool things, and we give them this unspoiled, amazing gift. We hand it over to them, and they ruin it. Can you imagine that? Don't you think that we would be just a little bit mad? I mean, don't you think that you and I would be a little bit ticked off? I, I know that we would. I mean, imagine if you give your kids like a, a brand new expensive gift at Christmas, and like Christmas night, they break it. You're not going to be happy with that, are you? Especially if it was something that was expensive. You're going to be a little bit upset. You're going to be a little bit angry with it. If we were writing this story, and we create this amazing environment, and we hand it over to this guy and this girl, and they destroy it, we're going to want to destroy them. I mean, that's how we're going to respond. We're going to erase the mistake that is called mankind. Thank God, literally, we weren't writing the story. Thank God he didn't respond the way that you and I would respond. See, what God did when we messed up, is he gave us exactly what we don't deserve. See, they deserve death when they sin. Remember verse 16 in chapter 2? He said, the day that you eat of the tree of knowledge of good and evil, you will surely die. They deserve to die. That, that, that was a consequence of their sin. Well, they didn't die. I mean, they didn't die immediately like that. They lived, you know, I think, like a thousand years, and then they eventually died. But they, they didn't die right there. They weren't even separated from God, at least not completely. God didn't even abandon them. They had a long and painful conversation. They tried to hide from them. They tried to hide from God. They had this very difficult conversation. But God didn't disappear from their lives. He didn't even stop providing for them. He didn't even, I mean, he didn't just get so mad and say, I'm done with you. I mean, you can go and live, but I'm washing my hands of the whole thing. He disciplined them. They didn't deserve discipline. Though. They deserved death. There's a huge difference. When your kids mess up, you discipline them. You don't give them death because they've messed up. There's a big, big difference between discipline and death. And so he didn't give them what they deserved. He disciplined them. And discipline is what you do when your children disobey because you love them. Not because you hate them. Not because you're angry at them. You do it because you love them. We're trying to discipline Abigail right now. I told you yesterday she was getting into everything. We're, she's in that stage. Like she's not two, but she's approaching the terrible twos quickly. And she's only like, what, 14 months at this point, almost 15, I should know that, I'm going to get in trouble for not knowing that perfectly to the day and the minute. But anyways, um, she's acting up. She is. She's just, I mean, she's being extremely defiant. So we're trying to teach her discipline. Um, I say we. Basically, it's, it's mommy with a spoon because I, she, I can't. She cries and I just fall to pieces. So she, gets, she acts up and says, well, mom's going to get you. You better watch out. Eventually, that's how it works, Dad. When you have a little girl, isn't, isn't that the normal thing? Yeah, Paul, you know what I'm talking about back there. Exactly. Uh, but anyway, so I mean, we're trying to just, and, and you know, early on, we get we get a wooden spoon. I mean, we're not beating our child, and we just go and we give her a little swat on the bottom. She's wearing a diaper. She doesn't even feel it. Well, early on, we did that, and her whole world, she just fell apart. She thought it's the worst thing in the world, even though she didn't feel it. Well, after a couple of weeks, she's like, that's not that bad. <laughs> it's not hurting me at all. So now, like yesterday, she was standing up on the table like, Abigail, get down, Abigail, get down. And she's just like, she smiles. I said, yeah, I'm not going to do that. I'm not going to get down. And so I said, Abigail, get down. Your mom's going to have to get you. And she let get down. So I said, Mom, go get her. And so Brittany just takes out the spoon and she goes over there. She's like, do you want me to have to swat you? And she just smiles and sticks out her tongue. And so then she just gives her a little swat on the bottom of that. Abigail laughs at her. Like, it doesn't bother her at all. So we're trying to find, so if you know a better way to um, discipline your children, we're looking for one uh, right now. We're in the market at this point. All right, that's a long enough rabbit to chase right there. My point is this. We discipline our kids because we love them. We're not disciplining Abigail because we're mad at her, we're angry at her, or you know, we're just out to get her. We're disciplining her because we love her. And we want her to grow up, and we want her to be a good person. We don't want her to be a sociopath. And she needs to understand that there are rules, and you have to follow the rules. And God disciplined those first two people. He didn't give them what they deserved. He disciplined them because he loved them. In fact, the writer of Hebrews in chapter, uh, chapter 12, verse 26 says that the Lord disciplines those that he loves. You don't discipline other kids. You don't go into someone's house at, at 9 o'clock at night and say, I heard your kids racking up at school. Here's the paddle. You're, you're a crazy person if you do that. No one's going to do that. You discipline your children. 
You are the biggest threat to the kids that you love the most. You are the biggest threat to them. You are the one. You are the, you are the parents. You're the mom and dad that comes to mind. And they do something they shouldn't do, and they're like, oh, dang it. Mom and dad are going to try it out, and they're going to get me. You are the ones they think. They don't think about anybody else. But at the same time, tell me if I'm not right on this. At the same time, when they're afraid, when they're sick, when they need something, when they want to play, when they just want to be held, who comes to mind? You do. Mom and dad do. Who gets the biggest smile when they come in the room? Mom and dad do. Because you discipline your kids. Because you love them. See, that's why after God banished them, he didn't say, I'm done with you. I'm washing my hands of this whole thing. He said, you've done wrong. And now you're going to be disciplined, but I'm not giving up on you. And so in the very next move, God gives them something that they didn't deserve. He gives them clothing. Because up to this point, they've been naked. There was no shame. There was no guilt. Now they're moving into a world of shame and guilt and condemnation. And God provides again for them. Even after this huge, colossal failure when they dropped the ball. So there it is again. Even in their sin, we see God's grace. See, from the very beginning, like three pages into your Bible, maybe two if it's a bit, you know, it's a small print. Two pages into your Bible, we see God establishing this pattern of how he's going to respond to us when we mess up. And he's not going to be out to get us. He's not going to throw a lightning bolt. He's not going to give up on us. What he's going to do is he's going to show us grace. He's going to respond to our sin with undeserving and amazing grace. Well, then we keep moving forward in the story. And after that, God lets us in on a little bit of a secret. And this is what he tells us. He foreshadows in the first couple of chapters, the first three chapters of your Bible, God says, my grace is not ended here. It's going to continue. But then he lets us in on a little secret when he goes and he has a conversation with the serpent. And he foreshadows in the single greatest example of his grace and his love. And he says, look, one day someone's going to come for me. And they didn't know who it was at the time, but we know it was Jesus. Someone's going to come for me. And he's going to have the authority to wipe away sin, to forgive your sin. He's going to have the ability and the authority to reestablish that relationship, that connection, that intimate fellowship with God that was broken in the garden. He says one day he's going to come and he's going to accomplish that. And again, he's not forced to do it. He doesn't have to do it. He's simply going to do it because he loves you. Once again, we get a picture of grace. We get a picture right there of the greatest example of grace that is going to happen. That's what we just celebrated at Christmas, folks. We just celebrated, we just celebrated the fact that from the very beginning... God knew before he created the world, before he created the universe, he knew he was going to create this whole thing. We were going to ruin it. We were going to mess it up. And the only way that we could have a relationship with him again, the only way that we could go to heaven was if his son one day came, 2,000 years ago at that first Christmas, came with the intention of going to the cross and dying for our sins. He created knowing that we would turn against him, that we would rebel, that we would sin, knowing that it would send his son to the cross, not force him. He'd willingly do it, but he created knowing that it was going to require Jesus to go to the cross and die the very worst kind of death in human history so that we can have that relationship with God reestablished. Folks, you don't have to go very far into your Bible to find a clear picture of grace. You don't have to go very far into your Bible to find a bunch of clear pictures of grace. And so many people, they have this misunderstanding that the grace is only found in Jesus and Sometimes it's not even found there. But folks, it's all throughout your Bible because from the very beginning, God has been dealing with us in grace. And we have to be a people that give that representation to the world. See, folks, for the church, grace is our secret weapon. Grace is the one thing that the world can't give. Gordon MacDonald said, you don't have, the, the, the world can do almost anything that the church can do. You don't have to go to church to build a house. You don't have to go to church to feed the poor. You don't have to go to church to heal somebody. You can go to a doctor and not believe in God or anything like that. There's almost anything that you can do outside of the church that you can do in the church. Here's the one thing you can't do in the world. The world cannot offer grace. Grace belongs to God. And because we are God's ambassadors here on earth, grace belongs to the church. It's our secret weapon. And it's so vital and it's so important that we are a people of grace and a people of love. And that the people that we encounter that don't know our Lord, they experience that kind of grace from us because they're going to associate who he is with the kind of people that we are. And we want to be Christ followers that accurately represent him. So that's why we're beginning this new series. That's why over the next few weeks, as we head into 2016, we're going to be talking about grace. We're going to be looking at examples of God's grace. We're going to be talking about how we can be people that 
that show grace, that just irrational, illogical, insane, crazy kind of grace that God shows to every single one of us on a daily basis. And it didn't start right now. It started in the very beginning when he created this whole thing. He created mankind in grace, and one day he's going to completely restore and redeem and save all of mankind with grace. Please bow your heads with me. And maybe some of you are here today and you've never really thought about God as, as being a, a God of grace. Maybe your understanding, your depiction of God was that, he, that He's angry. That He's out to get you. That He's got a whole bunch of rules and requirements and not a lot of grace and not a lot of love. But we just look at the first story that we have in the Bible and it shows us that's not the case. Because in the beginning, God's rules were minimal. But God's grace was infinite. It was limitless. And here's the thing. He hasn't changed. The Bible says that God is the same yesterday and today and forever. He's, he's never changed. His character is the same today as it was back then. Jesus just gave us the perfect and clear understanding of the character of God. If you're here today and you've never made the decision to trust the Lord, to believe in Him, to say, you know what? I do believe you're God of grace. I'm never going to do enough good on my own to have that relationship with you. I'm never going to do enough, meet the standards, meet the requirements to erase my sin. It's just impossible. That's the first step in the right direction. The first step to that one-on-one -on -one relationship being restored that was broken in the, uh, in the garden that we just talked about. The very first step that takes place is just admitting that you're an imperfect person. That seems pretty easy to me because I know I'm not a perfect person. And I've never met a perfect person in this life. We just have to admit that we're sinners and we can't do it on our own. And then just say, okay, God, what do you have for me? And when we're willing to do that, he says, all right, here's my son. He came to the earth. He lived a perfect life and he died for your sins so that you and me could have a relationship, so that you could go to heaven, so that you could go through this life with someone that would help you and that would get you through the difficult times that are inevitable. But just like any gift that you receive at your birthday or Christmas or any time, it's not yours until you actually reach out and accept it. And if you're here today and you've never accepted the free gift of God's grace and forgiveness of the sins, then you don't have access to what we've been talking to. But it's so easy to have access. God's done all the work. He's done all the heavy lifting. All you have to do is just take the first step of faith and say, I can't do it on my own. And the Bible says, the scripture tells us that, that all we have to do, regardless of our sin and our shame and the stuff in the past, all we have to do is just confess that we're a sinner and accept who Jesus was and what he came to do. And then you're in. You're in the family of God. And nothing you'll do can ever remove you. Some of you may be here today and perhaps you feel like God is leading you to be a part of this church. As, as we try and start the new year right, we try to be a people that are defined by grace, defined by mercy. As we try to rebrand Christianity in our society. And if you feel God is leading you here, I hope that you will respond. I hope that you'll join with us because you're going to make this such a better church. You're going to make it such a stronger community of believers, but at the same time, you're going to have a group of people that will come around you and that will support you as well when, when things get tough. Whatever God might be speaking to you, in just a moment, you'll have time to respond. Father, we do love you, and we thank you so much for your grace, and God, we thank you for your mercy, and just the fact that you started this whole thing the, the, from the very beginning, from the first letter that was written. God, you started in grace, and we know that you've continued in grace, and that you're going to carry this whole thing out to the end in grace. God, I pray if there's someone here this morning that's never made the decision to trust you, to give you their life and accept what you're offering, Lord, I pray that your spirit would speak to them with the words that I would have and just impress upon them the seriousness and the urgency of this decision. We love you so much. We thank you for your son. We thank you for Jesus and what he did for us on the cross. It's in his name we pray. Amen. We invite you to stand now. We're going to have a brief time of invitation for you to respond for any reason. This is my desire.
Father, we thank you for this time. Bless the offering, God, that in this way we worship you also, God. We just thank you for your goodness and your grace. In your name, amen. Please be seated. And this is my desire. Yeah. 